sharing with them. I, I, I pastored for 12 years down in Florida. We have two campuses there. And, uh, you know, pastoring and preaching, traveling, I, I don't necessarily make the best series person. Uh, the moment you tell me to preach on one subject, I just kind of feel the Lord says preach on another. Uh, when I was in my senior year at Bible College Seminary, we were uh, being given an assignment uh, to prepare a 52-week sermon series. You know, they said if you want to prepare for senior leadership, you need to kind of lay it out there, what's the 52 uh, topics that you'd present to your board. And so I made the mistake of praying about it, and um, I wrote Holy Spirit 52 times. And they failed me. I got a big F. And so um, that kind of set the trajectory uh, for me in ministry. I just kind of really pray. I fast. I ask the Lord as we travel uh, what he wants to say to a specific group of people. And of course, if you know a pastor or leader and they, you know, preach the same thing or series, God bless them. That's who the Lord has mantled them to be. Uh, But the most anointed you is you. The most anointed you is you. Uh, Social media is such a great tool and it's such a great curse because so many people are addicted to social media where they just believe they have to mimic and copy everything that's out there. And what we end up having is a lot of echoes and parrots and not a lot of fresh anointing from the Holy Spirit. Uh, He wants you to dig for oil and find your voice too. And so um, I'm praying that the Lord would, would confirm that and speak to us. So Uh, At this service, I really feel that the Lord wants me to minister on the suddenlies of God. And so I'm going to uh, just preach under a fresh anointing. We're going to look at a couple of passages of Scripture and uh, see what the Lord has to do. Amen? Amen? Christianity is the most terrifying and exciting journey of your life. I talk a lot last service. I just fundamentally believe there's a lot of miserable Christians. We just settle into dead, dry, stale Christianity. We can't get anybody saved because they're looking at us. And so uh, I I believe that the Christian journey is uh, full of dares. Come and taste and see that I'm good, says the Lord. The biggest dare that's ever been presented before the church and I'm just constantly filled with excitement about what God wants to do in my life, my marriage, my family, uh, different churches around the country. So let's pray together. Would you grab the hand of the person next to you? Or if you don't want to touch them, because hopefully they don't have COVID, then, you know, don't touch them. Father, thank you for this morning. God, thank you that you have something that you want to do right now. Thank you that you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Lord, we just pray for a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit to come and break yokes, break bondage to religion, break bondage to schedules and routines and having to control and have our hands in everything. Lord, I pray that you'd restore the joy of our salvation this morning. Lord, I pray that you'd fill us with eager expectation, a hope of what's to come. Lord, we declare that our best days are ahead of us, not behind us. There's a fresh encounter waiting for us each and every day. In your name that I pray, amen. When I was in my mother's womb, she had a dream to name me Jeremiah. It was a supernatural birth experience. The Lord also told her that the devil would try to kill me numerous times in my life. I was born dead. The cord was wrapped around my neck. It almost killed my mom as well. I was kind of known as a miracle baby in the hospital. I was taken to a back room where they miraculously revived me. My parents had an idea that God wanted to use me uh, prophetically, but there's been numerous times in my life where I have known that I have escaped death, that God has spared me. And I began to walk with the Lord uh, seven years old is when I remember having my first prophetic dreams at night. I shared earlier my dad pastored a charismatic church in Indianapolis, Indiana. I never really met a religious devil until I went to Bible college. 
What I mean by that is we preached on healing growing up and we saw healing. We preached on the baptism of the Holy Spirit in fire and we saw people speak in tongues. We said we believed in prophecy and divine healing for today and we allowed prophecy in the church. And so I didn't know anything different. I thought that's what charismatic Pentecostal Christians experienced every time they gathered. Fast forward to going to Bible college seminary, I realized I was around people who knew about God but didn't know God. They had a form of godliness but denied the power. They said they believed in things theoretically, but they didn't welcome things in their everyday life. And so my perception and my expectation of Christianity early on was that you never know what's going to happen happen when God walks in the room. There was a foundation that was built in me from the the earliest uh, time that I can remember watching a woman who had been paralyzed for 32 years get up out of a wheelchair and run around the church at eight years old. It messes with your theology traveling around with my father to Redding, California, the Kansas City, the International House of Prayer, like where you get around people who have been worshiping 24 hours a day, uh, a day seven days a week for, 20, for 25 years now, and they, that will mess with your drive-through Christianity. Remember just going there, that was my dad's idea of a good family vacation, Take the Johnson boys to a prayer room and trap them for 40 hours. One of four boys, Josiah, Jeremiah, Samuel, and Paul. And we were just trapped in these kinds of settings where I'd be like, wow, they're, they're not bored. One of our friends used to say, God is not boring, you are. And I was just intrigued and fascinated, and they talked about the worthiness of Jesus. Like Jesus is so worthy that we're willing to give him unceasing night and day worship around the clock. Like you could walk it there at 4 in the morning at 4 p.m., and someone will be there, a group of people will be there worshiping the Lord. I, I was greatly impacted by miracles. I was impacted by the worship and prayer movement. And then I became addicted to reading revival history, and that's when I really got messed up. I tell people the number one way to fuel spiritual hunger is to become a student of revival history. I begin to read about Azusa Street and William Seymour and Charles Parham. I talked about that last night. I, I begin to read about the Hebrides Revival. I be, begin to read about the First and Second Great Awakening, Charles Finney and, and John Wesley, all these great men and women of God. So it stirred my faith for more. Then I begin to dive into the scriptures, the book of Acts, and I begin to ask myself, why is what they considered normal abnormal in America? Why do we have to hear testimonies about what God is doing in Brazil and Africa and around the world? Lord, I, I'm, I celebrate and I'm excited about testimonies of the past or even what you're doing right now in other places. But Lord, I want to be an inheritor. I want to walk in that power. I want to flow in the Spirit of God. I, I don't want to, I want to get to the place where I don't pray for encounter. I am an encounter. And Lord, I just I don't want to just sing songs. You know that song we like to sing when he walks into the room? Everything changes. Have you guys heard that one? I mean, I want I want that for real. And then we have this landscape of the church where people are tired of hypocrisy. They're tired of being patronized and tickled and lied to. They're, they're tired of a show. I see a generation in America and the nations of the earth that want something tangible. They want something real. They want something relational. 
And the word that God has always put on my heart when we're on the West Coast is that many people see dry bones, but God sees an army. That there's a divine window of time. There's a divine opportunity in the earth today, in California, in Fairfield, for you and I to rise up and seize the day. The military has terminology, carpe diem, seize the day. That there are many things that happen in life that can wait and will get there. But there are many encounters with the Holy Spirit that unless you step out in faith right now, they will pass you by. I wanted to just read a a scripture that many of us are familiar with out of the book of Esther. Esther was a woman raised up in her generation. A lot of us know this tagline, but Here's Esther's biography in one verse, Esther 4.14. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. And you and your father's house will perish. And who knows whether you have not attained royalty For such a time as this. Esther, we know, is being groomed and prepared to save the Jews. And there's this phrase that hangs over her life, who knows? One man said, some men dream dreams and ask why. Other men dream dreams and ask why not? I want to let you know this morning that there's a dream that God has for your life. And He is teaching you and I how to know our scroll. There is a scroll. There is a dream. There is a destiny. There is a purpose that God has for each and every life. And that phrase, Who knows whether you will fulfill the plans and purposes of God over your life or not. That phrase is more real than you can imagine. In essence, God tells Esther, I'm going to fulfill my purposes in this generation. But who knows whether you'll respond in obedience or not. See, as I've walked with the Lord, I realize it's really not about me. It's like getting in intercessory prayer meetings and people start begging God to pour out His Spirit. And I'm sitting there saying, wait a minute. In Joel 2, God has said, I will pour out my Spirit. So we can take it to the bank right now that in the last days, God is going to pour out His Spirit. We don't have to plead. We don't have to beg. I'd encourage you, don't debate. God will pour out His Spirit. So if God is going to pour out His Spirit, the question is not when, it's where. So rather than wasting our time trying to figure out when God will pour out His Spirit, are we spending time making room and saying, Lord, do it right here? (laughs) Esther was raised up for such a time as this. I believe that you and I are living in, in this hour and in this time for such a time as this. We are not here by mistake. We are not here by coincidence. You hear people say, well, I would love to meet this Bible character. Can I give you a revelation? Folks, Bible characters long to peer into these days. Hope that flips your lid. 
You read your Bible and wonder what it would be like to be part of an inferior covenant where they could only peer between a veil. And they look at this covenant that we now live under, that we have been given unlimited, unhindered access to the throne of God. The Holy Spirit isn't just around us. He lives deep down on the inside of us. Where I no longer need to seek out a... I'm really going to mess with your theology. Where I'm no longer under an inferior covenant where I have to seek out a prophet to get a word from God. I'm living underneath a new covenant where I can get a word from God for myself. I want to encourage awe and wonder in your life. I want to encourage you to take some time during the day or at night and lay in your bed or sit in your car and say, God, this is unbelievable that I'm alive in the earth right now. When you do that, you'll make war on entitlement, which is choking out the plans of God in this generation where we think God owes us something. How many of us are here today and you think you're doing God a favor by being here? Wrong. We think we're doing God a favor. It's like I heard a pastor, he mentioned his salvation testimony. God got a good thing when I got saved. When you get in touch with the God of the universe choosing to carry out his will in the earth through you and I, it should touch us in a profound way that produces eternal gratefulness. The hardly meet grateful people these days that are excited about what God's doing in the earth and they just can't wait to give Jesus back what he's worthy of. God doesn't owe me a thing. Well, brother, why do bad things happen to good people? That's not biblical theology. Can I give you biblical theology? Why do good things happen to bad people? I know this stuff doesn't preach or sell. But when you swallow this entitlement and you think God owes you something, And you're God's gift to the earth. And there's this pride and this arrogance and a blindness where you begin to miss the divine opportunities that God wants to give you to change the world around you. God raised up Esther and her generation and said, I'm going to rescue the Jews, but it's up to you whether I'm going to use you or not. And what that should bring is a weight and a fear of the Lord that should drive you to the secret place. This this kind of sobriety, I, I don't know how it sits on you. The Bible has two words for time. Chronos where we get the word chronological, and then kairos. Chronological, or that Greek word chronos, it has to do with a set time on a schedule. The challenge that we have before us is how do we seize kairos moments in a world that's being governed by chronological time? This word for such a time as this has to do with those kairos moments where again, if you don't act right now, 
God will pass you over. There's this thing where we've got more time. You ever tried to diet? Well, I'll start eating healthy when not. We just, we put off. You get a word, you need to do this. Well, I've got time. I've got years. See, the more time that we think that we have, the more apathetic and lethargic we become. It's very rare that you meet people with a sense of urgency. Like, if you really believed that Jesus Christ was coming back tonight, if you would change a lot of things in your life, you're in danger. What would our lives look like if we had an urgency that Jesus Christ was returning tonight? How would it affect your urgency to share the gospel with everyone that you knew? How would it affect your interactions at work or with your spouse? If I knew Jesus Christ was returning, I promise you I wouldn't spend my life building up my bank account. I mean, I'm I'm talking about eternity impacting every area of my life. God is raising up Esthers in this generation. There are people sitting in this room that have divine destiny upon your life. The plans and the purposes of God are great. And the Spirit of God is asking you today, how long are you going to keep putting it off? Well, brother, when I get cleaned up, I'll come to God. Lie. The truth is you need to come to God right now, and then He'll clean you up. I'm trying to warn you, though, there's a spirit of the age that's at work in the church where we are putting off, we are creating options that are not biblical. There's only one way to heaven. There are not many ways to heaven. There's only one. There's only one, when you give people options and there's really a narrow way, you comfort them in sin that will send them to hell. See, like any good father or mother, you want the best for your children. You want them to succeed in life. But how many of us know there are some opportunities that we let pass us by and we've been riddled with shame and guilt and condemnation of what if see folks I'm not living my life with a what if I'm not living my life with regrets I'm willing to step out I'm willing to say yes I'm willing to say Lord I'm available and quite frankly I don't care if people think I look stupid I would rather act in faith I would rather pursue my dreams I would rather be told no than just drown in complacency and lethargy See, we we planted a church in Florida. I was 20 years old. And I was told, you're too young. I was told you needed more degrees. I was told you you needed a business plan. And I said, I've got a word from God. See, I want to encourage somebody here. All you need is a word from God. You've got to get some conviction in your belly. See, we we need some resiliency. We need some perseverance. We need some individuals willing to grab hold of God and not willing to back down in an hour of crisis. We were in six buildings in six years and we kept outgrowing everything. I just said, we're going to do it the Bible way. 
We had no money for flyers, so we were the flyers. Preaching the gospel, signs, wonders, and miracles. Not wasting time talking to people about God. Began to Jericho march a facility. Lord said, if you'll Jericho march this facility at night at midnight for 21 days, I'll deliver this building into your hands. Folks, I'm telling you, God is going to raise up an uncommon people in the earth who function in an uncommon anointing, walking in uncommon faith. I want to try to confront logic and reason and make you uncomfortable for another 10 minutes. I want to challenge you that the saints of old operated in unusual faith. They dreamed dreams with God which required His divine intervention. If you can fulfill your dreams by yourself, your dreams are too small. I want to dream dreams so big that it requires divine intervention. Like, Lord, I've stepped out, and if you don't act now, I'm going to look utterly, ridiculously stupid. I'm trying to tell you this morning, you came here because God is trying to tell you, stop playing it safe. Stop keeping your cards close. Stop swimming with the current of society. I'm looking for people this morning who are going to swim upstream. I'm looking for people who aren't going to hang out in the shallows. I'm looking for some frontline soldiers in California who recognize that the harvest is ripe, that there's opportunities available in 2021 that weren't available in 2020, and that door ain't going to open next year, baby. That door's open right now. So I start Jericho marching this building, and yes, the neighbors called the cops on me. What are you doing? I'm on a fast, and I'm marching around this building. We don't have the money, but I've got a word from God. See, I don't lie. I don't care what people think. You ever been on a divine assignment, and you end up backing down because you think that they'll they'll think you're cuckoo? You are cuckoo. You are crazy. We are people. Have you ever tried to explain to your your friends and family you tithe? You give what? And then when you get delivered of tithing, uh uh-oh, can I go there for a minute? I've been delivered of tithing. I don't tithe. When I started walking in the kingdom... And I started believing God and I started operating in faith. I was going through this process. If under an old covenant, in my own strength, I was required to give 10%. That's the law. In my own strength. Are you going to tell me that now in a new covenant, in God's strength, I can give less? This makes people uncomfortable. No, I actually got a kingdom revelation, not a church revelation, a kingdom revelation that under the new covenant, 10% is no longer the maximum, it's the minimum. See, I, I pity people who give 10%. I feel even sorrier for people who don't give anything in an offering. Because what if it's all God's? I I came here this weekend to rattle some of your theology. What if it's not your money, it's His? And what if you'll never understand stewardship if we don't recognize ownership? It's his money, it's his car, it's his, it's his kids. 
I mean, when we've been bought with a price, we're no longer ours. I don't tell God what to do. He tells me what to do. I'm not the potter. I'm the clay. Or maybe we just bought into the self-help American gospel. No, when we come into the kingdom of God, we surrender our rights and we get on the wildest roller coaster ride that's ever been built. The freedom, the liberty, the joy, the adventure, the not being afraid to fail. It's so much fun. Remember, I met my wife. We were in Bible college. You know the first question I asked her, the very first question, most sm- smoking hot chick I'd ever seen. How do you feel about giving money to missions? First question. Because it was that important to me. Honey, I want to develop a kingdom value system concerning finance that's completely antithetical to American Christianity. I want to set a goal on the first date that we're not giving 10% to God. We're going to live to give 90. I know it's quiet in here. <laughs> So we're thinking, man, this guy's radical. What if I'm not? What if what we consider radical today is just biblical? See, we we want what, what they had in the Bible, but yet we're unwilling to pay the price that they paid. But so to me, the price is nothing because I'll cash in on the joy and the excitement and the trust and the dependence upon Jesus and the closest. I'll, I'll take that any day than having control of my life and being a robotic Christian. I remember we were buried a month, Pastor Richard, and I just, I wanted to be a blessing. We had $4,400 in our bank account. We thought we hit the jackpot, you know, wedding and the gifts. And there was a pastor's gathering in town. And the Lord taught me, you have to sow where you want to go. Oh, Lord, here in America, everybody wants to go and they don't know how to sow. Pastor's gathering was in town and it was at a sushi restaurant. I didn't eat sushi. I didn't know how expensive it was. It's like 50 pastors there, and I showed up and said, I'll pay the bill. Well, it was like $4,000. And a lot of people, when you talk about generosity, they're talking about their checking, not their saving. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about like, I gulped hard. meal, $400 tip. Married one month. You know, I I went home to a wife who wasn't angry. She wasn't scared. She was more excited than I was. No, we, we worshiped for some hours and we thanked God for the opportunity to be a blessing to someone else's life. You see how the entitlement thing and, oh God, you owe us and look what we did for... No, we thank, thank you, Lord, for presenting this opportunity before us that by sowing into these pastors and leaders that have been faithful for decades, we begin to pioneer a path in our 20s that's now opened up in our 30s and heading into our 40s. And I don't like to just tell stories of old. I mean, folks, when you begin to move in the river of God 
and you recognize everything that he has given you is a tool that can be used to expand his kingdom. Every dollar, every child, every bonus, every minute, no time wasted. When you have that urgency and that excitement that begins to rumble down on the inside of you, when you begin to step out in faith, God begins to do a supernatural work in you, but it will start angering people around you. There's nothing like catching fire around people that are stuck in neutral zone. It's nothing like hitting the accelerator and saying 10%, forget that, I'm giving it all. We moved to Charlotte last year. There's a lot of racial tension on the East Coast, as I'm sure it's on the West. We moved to Charlotte, and I needed uh, some box springs for my daughters, their beds. And so I went into a mattress firm, and there was an African-American family in front of me. By the time their credit card got declined twice, I'd been in these moments for so long, I didn't even question why I was there. See, I, I, don't, want to, I don't want to keep going back here. But when you say yes to the Lord, I'm available, I'm all in, I'm shutting all the exit doors, you begin to walk a walk of faith that eliminates coincidence. It silences the, 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 the questions of who and what. Because again, by the time you're ready to say yes, the opportunity has gone. It's like, you know, talking to Christians. We were at a conference recently, and I felt like the Lord said to me that there were people there that had an immediate financial need. He said, if you're here and you have an immediate come forward. So there was a line of people. And then to the people in the crowd, I said, go ahead and stretch forth your hands. And I said, and right now we're not going to do the religious Christian thing where we just say, well, we'll pray for you, brother. Amen. I said, we're going to do the Bible. So more than just pray, I want you to ask the Holy Spirit who you're going to bless right now. Like right now. Because Jesus said like crazy things, if or when you see your brother in need. You don't need prayer time to decide if you're going to give to the need. I just believe so many things in the Christian faith that we think we need a fleece for and we need 68 prophetic words for. If we'll just lay it all down and say, yes, Lord, your life would be a lot more exciting and terrifying. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. I wouldn't have in any other way. Oh. There was abundant grace upon the New Testament church because of what I'm talking about that I'm convinced in America we, we know hardly anything about. And so folks just began to come forward in this meeting. Money. I mean, we... we rent being paid for, cars being paid. I mean, it, it was like a Holy Ghost bomb went off in this conference when we decided to act like Christians. So I'm marching around our church building, going back to that story. On the 21st night, we meet with the building owners. They don't even believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit. Church of Christ, instruments are of the devil. We get this meeting. The Spirit of the Lord came upon me, and I said, the Holy Spirit says, you're going to give us this building for $1 million, and you're going to give us the down payment for it. Have you ever seen Star Wars where Luke would wave his hand? I mean, within a millisecond, they said, yes, you have a deal. Our elders about fell out of their chair. I'm in the mattress store and the card gets declined twice and bam, what? I didn't even, 
I don't even care how much, is it 6,000, 7,000, I don't even care. And they start crying, saying we have hate in our hearts for our white brothers. Because my father was killed by a police officer and just some of this stuff. And then the guy working the deal, he's a Baptist guy, leader, leader of the Bible study. And he's like, what is going on? We have this time of prayer with our black brother and sister and their three kids. And I said, so that you might know that every time you lay your head to rest on this bed, you'll know God's good. Again, it, it's, it's, those, it's those Kairos moments. I walked into that store and I could have just said, well, just another day, another bed. No, I was sent there as a divine agent of change representing a kingdom that is not of this world. I do not operate according to the, the standards of the world. And again, and I'm not going to spend 15 minutes about, yes, it's like you have to call it, well, brother, what about this? And I'll let you, well, brother. You, if you know me, you know I'm, you know. But we have so much, well, brother, the, I'm going to get in trouble, the Dave Ramsey plan. And well, brother, the, God bless him, I've met him. I, I'm not against structure. I'm against structure without life. I'm not against form, but I'm against form without power. I'm not against logic and reason, but I believe many of us have drifted down this religious path of literally ordering and controlling our very existence that it has stolen from us the adventure and the joy and the supernatural grace that rested upon the first day's church that I believe is going to be doubled on the last day's church. took my kids to the play place the other day. Jesus went about doing good. What if wherever that you went, you just looked for windows and opportunities to do good? We're at a birthday party. There's 40, 40 little kids running around. Now this time it wasn't well, their credit card got declined. It was joy in my heart. Praise God, I'm going to pay for the kid's birthday party. I'm just laughing in the corner saying, Lord, thank you so much for sending us here to this play place while birthday parties going on. This is awesome. You love little kids. It's like $236 or whatever. Bam, we pay it. And the parents just run up and they're like, what the... Do we know you? No, but God does. And, and, and I promise you, all, all of a sudden, we, we have an opportunity to witness to 200 people in a mall the gospel of Jesus Christ at a birthday. I mean, how... how how many opportunities collectively in this room are we about to run into this week that I'm telling you we don't need a prophetic word, we don't need some over-spiritualization, we just say, Lord, all I am is yours, I'm available, I'm willing, I'm open. Lord, if I can serve, if I can give, if I can, when this DNA gets down on the inside of it, I'm telling you, Queen Esther had it. She knew that she was born for such a time as this. But might I just mention the story of Samson in passing. Some of you, you've got the goods. You've got the gifts. You've got stuff locked up on the inside of you like our boy Samson. But you know, he was a deceived by a Delilah spirit. That cunning, seductive whisper from the world that said, you've got time. 
telling you there's a Delilah spirit in the church that's whispering and that's stroking people, that's coddling them, telling you, it's all right, you'll get to it next year. You know, the lesson that Saul had to learn is that partial obedience is no obedience at all. And by the time she tricks him and deceives him, the Bible says in the book of Judges, he did not even know that the Spirit of God had left him. I still got it. I'll get to it. I'll do it next year. And then by the time you're ready to do it, you don't even know the Lord's moved on. See, I I would rather have a zealous, passionate people not wanting to miss out on the purposes of God in this. I would rather be in that company and challenge them and provoke them to believe. I'd rather be in that company than be in a religious company that's born on routine and the monotonous and the chronos. And I'd rather be in this group because I know in this group that God's grace and his mercy are overabundant. I believe that we have a father in heaven who loves when his sons and daughters try. They said yes to the church building at that price, but we didn't have the money. Have you ever made a deal that you didn't have money for? See, sometimes, folks, I'm trying to help somebody. You just got to do baby steps. You got to take it one step at a time. You've got to take that step out and say, all right, Lord, here I am. And so I've been prophesying to people randomly all throughout the United States for 20 years. You know, it was like a fruit farmer in Iowa who I gave a prophetic word to in a blizzard 14 years ago, who hands me a business card back then and says, if you ever need anything, call me. I'm just warning you, if you do that to me, I'm calling you. (laughs) I don't let people pray prayers and step out in faith and they don't mean it. I'm going to call you on it. So we'd lock into this deal, and I called all throughout the country individuals who had handed me their business cards and said, if you ever need anything, call me. 17000 here, 50000 here, a hundred. I collected over a million dollars cash in two weeks. Just trying to tell stories, not so that you would be impressed with mine, but that you would hunger for your own. I'm trying to tell stories this morning, not so that you would be impressed with mine, but that God would sow faith into your heart that you would begin to believe God for your own. Can I tell one last story and pray for you? I was a pastor's kid. I went to Bible college and my mom falls mentally ill. My dad gets out of ministry. I pray and said, Lord, what do I do? My dad, my, the Lord said, go home and hold your dad's hands up or he'll die. I didn't know he became suicidal. Roles got reversed. Sometimes your life and your journey in God, it's full of pain. It's not what you thought. There's questions about whether God, Lord, I stepped out and prayed for her and she had cancer and she died. And here we go with the whole offense thing that I talked about last night. I've stepped out and believed and then tragedy strikes my own family, pastor's kids. My two brothers said to the Lord, if this is what my parents get for serving you, forget you. Told you one of them was in a federal prison. He still is today. My mom, her mind has never returned. I'm talking about lights are on and no one's home. It's who I relate to every week, yet I see the power of God touch lives. 
So I leave Bible college and I, I literally, I find myself, it's like literally going from a setting like this to a setting like the, the devil. I told you I, there's a reason why I hate him. Because I know firsthand the destruction that he brings to marriages and families and pastors' kids. My dad couldn't even be in ministry anymore. His name's Joseph. He goes to a factory. He starts working 60 hours a week. The Lord says, go in after him. So I literally went from the, the, the president, the best student at the Bible college, to I'm working in a factory. In the winter, there's no heat, and in the summer, there's no A.C., and I'm sitting there on this journey of faith, all just saying, Lord, what? This is not. And I thought I was done, you know, like you, you, you believe you paid your dues. All right, Lord, I'm available. I said yes. I gave the money. Now leave me alone. Let me go back to the logic and reason and play it safe. And here's the, you know, 10% or the free will offering. That's like half a percent. I remember praying and the Lord said to me in the factory, Jeremiah, there's a greater crucifixion for your soul that awaits you. And I'm binding the devil in the name of Jesus. He said, I want you to go to India and live in a leper colony. I went from what I thought was the greatest tragedy of my life. If you like the UFC, you might get this. I went from there to ground and pound. I moved out to India in a leper colony and was spit on by Muslims and Hindus every day. I lost 60 pounds. I, I was out in the, you, you wake up thinking if they killed me, they'd never find my body. I, I'm all the way around the world and I'm in the, the worst of days. On this faith journey, I lived on 17 cents a day. I've known what it's like to have much and I've known days where I didn't know how, where I was going to eat. And I'm out there and the Lord gives me a dream and he says, it's time to go back to school. And I said, never, Lord, I'm not going to that religious place. Three nights in a row, I have a dream. Go back to Southeastern University. I'm gonna send you back in the spirit and power of John the Baptist for a student awakening. Problem was I had no money. Imagine that. God calling you to something today where you don't have resources. Praise God. It's not about you. An uncle paid for my flight from Delhi to Tampa, Florida. I borrowed a car. I pulled over on I-4 three times weeping, saying, God, I can't do this. See, sometimes the yes will come easy. Other times God's going to ask you to do things that are going to seem insane. I went to the registrar's office I said, I'm Jeremiah Johnson. I've done two years here. I've had a family tragedy. I've gone to India, but the Lord's calling me back. They said, you're too late. You don't have any money. There's no way you can get in. Back then, I fasted all the time because I had no money. It was mandatory. Give us this day our daily bread. I'm not kidding. On day seven, somebody calls my friend and says, hey, there's this lady, she wants to meet with Jeremiah Johnson. So I walked to a McDonald's a couple miles. I, didn't have, I literally had nothing. She said, tell me your story. I told her my story, much like I told you today. She gets out a check and writes me a check for 10000 puts me into school the first semester. She paid $67,000 until I graduated, and I've never met her in my life. I, 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 even, even as I've been preaching the last 45 minutes, an hour, I, I've had hundreds of testimonies run through my mind of my life that I believe the Lord has raised me up in this generation to challenge, to confront, to encourage the body of Christ. When you see men and women of God before you, don't become addicted to their stories. Dream with God and make your own. Amen. 
Now, I'm about to pray some crazy prayers. And if you do not want a part of the prayer, I will not be offended, one. And two, I would just bind it. As I start praying, just say, no, God, no. But oftentimes, the very places the Lord calls us to is the very places we resist. Brother, how do I know the voice of God? What, what, which one is it? It's the one that tells you what you don't want to do. There, I just saved you the whole seminar. I believe that the Lord wants to release suddenlies upon you. I believe that the Scriptures would call this an Issachar anointing. Men and women who understood the times Israel was living in and what they must do. We're living in a critical hour in the earth where this anointing is going to come upon the church and they're going to begin to operate in unusual faith. They're going to find themselves in unusual places and unusual spaces. They're going to be quick to obey. They're not going to need a whole lot of prayer time. They're just going to, if I could, if I could, deliver you from religion and welcome you into the kingdom, I would literally just simply say, hear and obey. How do I do kingdom life? Listen and obey. Can you do that? Listen and obey. Listen for the voice of the Holy Spirit and be quick to obey whatever he puts in front of you. You're going to make mistakes. I tell you, I'm waving at everybody. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to step out in faith and be rejected. You're going to think that you heard God to pray for the lady and she dies of cancer. I can't tell you how many times that's happened to me. But it has never deterred me from keeping on praying. Because it is not up to me who he heals and who he doesn't heal. All he's asking me to do is step out in faith and pray. I'm not afraid to step out. I'm not afraid to, Lord, I'm just simply saying yes. Use me, mold me, shape me, wake me, quake me. I pray crazy prayers. Lord, wherever that I'm at, awaken me to what you want to do. And I believe that as we pray today, only God knows your heart. What he's going to release is joy, uncommon grace, a supernatural adventure. There's no telling. I literally pray that what God is going to do when you tell your story, either people will think two things. You are a liar or God is real. You know, that's what I thought about your pastor yesterday at lunch. You ever heard this guy's story? I told our team, he's e-, and there's no district. I said, he's either a liar or God's real. God's real. All right, let's bow our heads. I'm not a magician. I'm not a genie. I'm not a fortune teller. I'm a messenger. In Jesus' name, I bind up a poverty spirit in this place. And I'm telling you, you can be a millionaire and have a poverty spirit. Poverty spirit is having meager possibilities, small dreams. Lord, I bind that up in Jesus' name. And I ask, Lord, in this atmosphere that you would help us by your grace to dream your dreams. I feel it's very prophetic on this 30-year anniversary that we're here to celebrate 
but God is also daring this church to believe for more. God, I ask that you would open ears all over this place to hear. Go ahead and ask him, God, speak to me. Lord, awaken spiritual senses. This is about you hearing from God. Lord, we ask that you would activate sight and taste and touch and smell all over this place. Lord, awaken us to your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray for divine provision. Just hear the Spirit of God saying, why does it matter? what it looks like. Why does it matter who it comes through? Lord, we just lay down what we think destiny looks like. Your ways took me to India. Your ways took me to the end of me so you could begin. such great things for the kingdom, the narrative around their life would be only God could have done this. Some of you, God is speaking. It's time to have another child.
we thank you that you're the God of the impossible. Sarah was barren. What can't God do? God, finally, Lord, whatever happens in the weeks and months and years ahead, may you receive all the glory and all the honor. Lord, you bless the Israelites. And you said your blessing would be a blessing if they remembered you and a curse if they forgot you. Whatever you place in our hands, whatever you ask us to do, whatever whatever you bring about, Lord, I pray that people would forget our names. Let your name be king of all. hear God saying a dangerous people shall emerge out of California for there shall be an uncommon grace not seen as in the days of the book of Acts where there will be men and women that will arise out of this state that shall do great exploits. Here I am, Lord. Send me. Here I am, Lord. Don't pass me by, Lord.
you have a yes in your heart today, would you stand with me? You just have that yes, Lord, I'm willing. I'm available. I want to pray for us as we go. You know, the presence of God is so real and it's so captivating. You feel that drawing of the Holy Spirit. You don't want to leave. It's, it's about cultivating that. Father, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Forgive us for any ungratefulness, from any offense in our heart about what happened in the past. Lord, we choose to believe that you're good. We choose to trust you, that you have plans for us, plans to prosper us and give us a hope and a future. Lord, thank you for the suddenlies that are coming. Thank you for the Kairos moments. Thank you for the yeses, the salvations, the deliverances, Lord, the right time at the right place. Jesus, we love you. Hey, it's Jeremiah Johnson. I want to thank you so much for joining us at the Altar Global a growing movement of Christians who have a burden, a desire for the return of Jesus Christ and the preparation of the bride for that glorious day. I want to pray for you today. I know that you have needs, desires, things in your life that you're hoping, believing that God would answer. But before we do that, I want to just extend an opportunity to you to partner with the Altar Global in your prayers, your financial support. God is gathering a remnant of folks who just have a desire to partner with us on a monthly basis, or maybe you're even watching today and you just want to sow a one-time seed. I want to let you know as the founder of this movement, we're going to take the money, the prayers that you sow today and sow them right back into the kingdom of God. We're seeing souls saved, the church come alive like never before, missionaries, church planners being revived because of what God is doing. You're going to see a number pop on your screen. You can text to give. You can even click on the link in the comment section and there'll be an opportunity for you to give there. So let's pray today. Father, thank you for those watching today. Lord, thank you for the ministry of the Holy Spirit that is participating even with the bride saying, come Lord Jesus. Lord, I ask that you would meet every need today. Lord, I pray for breakthrough. I pray for salvation for lost loved ones. God, we believe that we are living in the greatest days that we have ever known. In the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you so much for joining us today. Stay tuned for another episode. Bye-bye.